Hello and welcome to another edition of What Does the Giraffe Say Media with me, Kathleen Rotorne. We are an organisation that aims to connect people in conservation by holding live interviews on social media. Today, I am very happy. I am joined by Margot Raggett, and she is the founder of the wonderful Remembering Wildlife series of books. So, Margot, I'm going to hand over to you. If you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and how it was that a safari trip to Kenya back in 2014 managed to completely change your life. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, so the potted history of my life <laughs> is that I worked in, in PR in London for 20 years, um, became a bit disillusioned about um, kind of promoting products and services that I didn't feel were contributing to the world, but I didn't really know what to do to change that. Um, decided to try and make my way as a wildlife photographer and spent a number of years working based out of the Maasai Mara um, as a resident photographer in a camp there. And, and that was really lovely. And I built my portfolio up. But then in 2014, um, I saw a poached elephant um, and that kind of changed everything for me. Um, he had a, an arrow still stuck in him from, um, and it was explained to me that what had likely happened, poachers have tried to um, to get him. They shot him with the arrow. He'd run off. He'd managed to escape from them, but the poison would have killed him very painfully. Um, and when we found him, hyenas had started to to kind of uh, to, to eat him, but the, the tusks were still intact. So it was a wasted death. And I was just mad as hell. I was like, no, I'm, I'm not having this. And I kind of realized as well that the, the safari world that most of us see is very sanitized. You're, um, you're in a, you know, usually a lovely camp or a lovely lodge somewhere and, and you know, you have your gin and tonics and you take some nice pictures and, and you don't see what's going on behind the scenes, whether it's poaching or snaring or, or many other things. And I just felt I needed to kind of use all my experience and contacts to, to, to bring awareness to elephant poaching. So I started um, asking other photographers who I got to know um, in the Maasai Mara as my start point and say, look, if I was to do a book um, or if I was going to do an exhibition or both, um, you know, would you give me an image each um, to, to create a book on elephants um, that could raise some money and, and awareness and and they all said yes which i wasn't necessarily expecting so in that first year we set out to make um i, I was expecting it to be a one-off book um i wanted 50 photographers for it um, we actually called it remembering elephants um and the idea of that was it was provoked by a couple of interviews i'd seen with um sir david attenborough and also with jane goodall uh, just talking about the rate of poaching currently and that if nothing changed, they might not be around in a couple of decades time. And, and I just thought, well, God, if that came to pass, then this book would be the memorial to what they had been like in the wild. Um, and what a shocking thought that is. And sometimes people get upset with me for using that, but I'm, I'm doing it deliberately, provocatively. You know, if we don't do something now, many of these species that we feature in the series won't be around anymore. Um, so yeah, so eventually this book came out, uh, Remembering Elephants, uh, and the cover picture is by a photographer called Federico Veronese, who's a wonderful photographer um, based out in Kenya. Um, and we launched it to much more success than I ever dreamed possible. Um, so that was back in, it, I started work, I saw the Poach Elephant 2014, announced I do the book 15, and then the book actually came out in September 2016. And you mentioned there that your your background was in PR. Do you find that that helped you when it was came to approaching people to come and give them your photographs? And also, did you find that with more people that were providing you photographs, then that, that kind of spiraled of other people wanting to, to get involved as well? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think because I kind of um, had that training in PR, I had 20 years of kind of instinct about, um, you know, how to run a project um, and how to make it appealing to people and, and, and how to market it. So it was very clear to me that if I could get lots of photographers who had their own kind of fan base and following and, and were well you know, loved and respected, talking about the fact they were excited to be part of this project, then that would help spread the word far more than, you know, if we did a, a book on a single photographer, no matter how amazing they are, you'd never get the spread of kind of awareness that we've managed to achieve by working with lots of people. So 
so yes, I think I, you know, and, and my business background as well, you know, I, I knew how to kind of write a decently crafted email to say, hello, you don't know me, but I've got the idea. I'm pleased when you let me have an image for free for this book. <laughs> um, but say, fortunately, lots of them said yes. And then when I had a few kind of big names under my belt, then it was much easier to say, well, look, Jonathan and Angela Scott are part of this. So would you like to be too? Because people trusted their judgment. So that really helped. And if it's, I know you've got, some incredible names working for you and providing you these photography. Um, do you get people as well that can send in their own pictures that they can then add to the book? Is that a possibility too? Yeah, what we do is we actually have a competition for 10 places every year. Um, so we're just now, um, I was just writing emails, inviting judges for that um, this morning for this year. So um, yes, because what I realised, said I set out to get kind of you know big names with big followings because that would help us sell lots of books but i i also recognize that there's lots of amazing photographers out there who don't necessarily have a big name or a big following and yet we might want to have their images so by doing a competition we made it democratic because everyone doesn't matter whether you're a pro amateur or everything in between is how i wrote it um could enter so and actually often um dare i say it some of the most popular pictures in the book have actually been competition winners each year so it's yeah it's definitely something we're committed to that's incredible we've got a comment coming through from stacy and she's saying um it's so important that people see beyond the sterility of a standard african safari and i completely agree and that kind of goes back to what you were saying with you saying this could be a book of remembrance rather than um you know what what the situation is now yeah. Um, do you find that people are now becoming a bit more kind of uh, shocked into action because of this? They're seeing these images and want to protect them? Um, I do. I mean, we've sold tens of thousands of books now, which I'm so pleased about. But, but our approach is not to actually show the picture of the poached elephant or the snared animal because, you know, I have wonderful friends who aren't anything to do with wildlife and they kind of say, oh, God, I see a picture like that on social media and I turn away, I can't bear it. And, and I... And I understand that kind of hitting people with the really difficult images sometimes is too much for people emotionally to kind of cope with. So, so my approach is to try and actually use the most beautiful images we can to, to pull people in. And then in my essays within the book, we cover off all of those issues. So we make people aware it's not just, you know, all this, you know, what you see is the pretty pictures. There's a hell of a lot going on behind the scenes. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I hope with the tens of thousands of books we've sold and also all the kind of publicity we do around them, including, you know, kind of chats like this, you know, we're helping to spread the word and, and get more and more awareness. And then and then obviously all the funds that we raise from selling the books, I'm able to kind of funnel back to, to great projects doing great work. So it's not just a talking shop, we're actually making a difference, I think. Yeah, for sure, definitely. We, I mean, I know you've got, um, you've had the support of the photographers, but you've also been incredibly lucky with having a lot of support from a lot of famous people. You've had presidents, conservationists, celebrities, all getting behind that. How do you make them aware? And is this something that they're, um, they, well, obviously they're keen to be part of? Yeah, I mean, in a way, you know, some of it is my secret and I <laughs> I can't give away um, all of how it works. Otherwise, everyone would be doing it. But, um, you know, what I would say is it's often just kind of friends of friends and the, and the same model works that, you know, what once you're kind of saying to someone, look, Russell Crowe is involved in this or Ricky Gervais is involved, then others are more, you know, likely to kind of want to, to also support you. And and it has made a real difference to our kind of awareness and, 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 you know, building the brand, you know, much more quickly than we would have been able to do otherwise. So I'm really grateful to, to all of these guys for, for their support. And I know because uh, you have several different books um, and six of them, in fact, and um, I know that there, some of the animals are very well known, your rhinos, your elephants, your, your great apes. Um, and then your recent one was, uh, was the wild dogs um, and the uh, painted dogs. Um, was this one that you were thinking wouldn't do as well because they're not so well known? What was your thoughts on this? Yes, I um, mean, I, I kind of, there are certain animals that are kind of big hitters, You like elephants are, you know, kind of so infinitely popular and so to so many people, they mean such a lot, um, you know, and lions the same. So I kind of, I'm aware that there are some books that are just going to be more popular than others. And and the, the risk with African wild dogs, as our research proved that we set out to kind of find in the UK is like 40% of people or something in the UK haven't even heard of African wild dogs. It just, you know, whereas everyone's heard of lions. So it was a kind of slightly harder 
um, subject to, to kind of gain momentum for. But because the series has, has been so popular and because we have so many kind of followers who now um, support us no matter what we do, I felt they deserved a book and I had the you know impetus to be able to actually produce one and make it a success. Um, so yeah, it, it was a gamble, but I'm really pleased how well it's gone. And and even you know, say getting the celebrities again to support it again, they might not necessarily have heard of it as a species. And and they're so beautiful, these dogs. They they deserve you know the the, the awareness just like all the other animals. And I think as well by doing so, it's a great way of people who weren't aware of um, of the African wild dogs and the threats that they're facing to become aware because they've seen all your other series and they're like, okay, well, we like these books. Let's give this one a go. And then they can learn from that process as well. Yes, exactly. So it's like all the other animals are helping their cousins, the African wild dogs to, to get that kind of message out. And I've had lots of messages from people saying, thank you for, for doing this. I have no idea how beautiful this species is. And now it's on my bucket list to want to try and see them. And I do actually say, you know, I almost envy the person who hasn't yet seen one because they're so incredible that the excitement of a, a sighting of African wild dogs is amazing. So um, everyone should get out and try and see them. I completely agree. I spent some time in Africa and didn't see them for three years. And when I finally did, um, I, I'll admit I had a little, I had a tear in my eye when I saw them because they're such incredible animals. So thank you for raising awareness for the work uh, with the work that you're doing. Um, with what you're doing, uh, if people want to check it out, uh, you can go onto the website, which I'm going to pull up now. Um, but you wanted to ensure these books were a business rather than a charity. Can you talk to us a little bit about how that works and how that's I mean, allowed you to raise an incredible 1.1 million US dollars? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, charities have their place, but I kind of looked at the world I live in and, and more and more, there are so many charities saying, please give us money. You know, you feel torn in a thousand different directions and actually, you know, I, I figured if I can just sell something beautiful to you and whether it's, you know, a beautiful book or a beautiful print or um, a piece of jewellery, like we have a jeweller who works with us as a cheetah pendant that we had on our Kickstarter campaign for that. Um, so people can buy something nice and know they're doing good. You know, I think that's the way of the world now. And, and there's more and more organisations out there. Like I bought some um, coffee the other day from my local supermarket and all of the money goes to women's education with that coffee and I buy toilet paper from there's a great company called Who Gives a Crap I don't know if you've heard of them but they're amazing um, they're really funny and cute in their marketing but 50% of their money goes to building toilets in Africa and you know that the old model of branding with my PR hat on was you know you, you create a brand that people trust and feel safe to buy because they know what they're going to get on the tin you know like Coca-Cola so you know what you're buying but it also says something about you. You know, you buy your sneakers and you buy a brand that you think makes you sound cool. You get an association. And, and I just think the world is now going in a place that the association we want to get is actually that we're good people and we care about the planet and we're giving back. And so more and more companies are springing up doing that kind of thing. And I want to be part of that. Um, you know, I, I yeah, I, I just find it kind of an easier way to raise money. And, and I've kind of... I think proven that um, I'm I'm correct in that assumption that I made when we set out because people do continue to buy the books and gift the books and and that you know all the profits can then go to a good cause. And then how do you do? Um, I'm going to pull into this actually now. So when you're doing the books, you know, initially you start doing it as a Kickstarter. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So that first year, um, I worked out that if I could raise £20,000, um, that would allow me to make 1,000 of the elephant books that I was aiming to make. And I really had no idea whether we'd be successful or not. So I, I set out to raise 20000 We had a month to do it. The way Kickstarter works is if you're not successful, then the project fails and you don't. no money is collected from people that have pledged mm -hmm. to it. So you, you have to hit that target. Um, and um, but what it means is you get the 20 is what I was aiming for there. That would make a thousand books, say 300 have been sold on the Kickstarter. I would then have 700 uh, kind of paid for books that if I sold, all the money could go to the cause. So that's the, the simple model. Um, but that first year, we, um, you know, from a standing start, no one having heard of us, we raised the 20,000 in 12 hours, I think, which I was just amazed at. I, I sat there and 
<clears throat> I was just kind of in the, in the afternoon of it going on or late, late evening, sorry, early evening, six o'clock. I pulled myself a glass of wine and was just, I get an alert on my phone every time someone pledged. So it would say, yeah. Kathleen just bought a book for £45. Yeah. And it would flash up on my phone. So I was just kind of like watching this go on and we hit the, um, the 20,000 on that first day, which was amazing. Um, and we've continued to, to, to hit that money. I always ask for 20 just because it's kind of our figure now. Um, for the last uh, six books that we've done and, and the quickest we've done it last year we did it in 21 minutes um, yeah. and it's just there are people in the wings waiting to support us wanting to kind of give us some momentum and I'm so grateful to all those who've you know kind of loyal supporters who are just you know willing us to keep going because it really makes a difference. And did you, when you first started out uh, with the elephant one, did you then think oh this is going to be something I'm going to be doing all the time or was it just you, you initially thought Oh, we'll do this book and then that was that yeah no i'd love to say i was very strategic and i had a 10-year plan um i didn't i just i thought i want to do a book on elephants and, and raise awareness and threw myself into that and threw myself into learning how to self-publish books how to run kickstarters you know how to get to know 50 photographers who i didn't know at that point but it was when we launched and they, we had such wonderful feedback from people and everyone said to me you've got to do a second book. And I was like, really? I, I was just planning on doing one. I don't know what you're talking about. But, but I then went out to Kenya very quickly after that book came out to visit some of the projects that we had um, supported in Meru in Northern Kenya. Um, and while I was there, I was able to go to Old Pejeta, which is where um, the last northern white rhinos are looked after. And, and the male there, Sudan, who you might have heard of. So he was the last male northern white, and sadly he passed gosh, I think it's a couple of years ago now, but he was alive at that point in his last few months. Um, and I actually went out with a friend, uh, we were just chatting before we went live, uh, Dan Richardson, who I think you're going to have next month, but he came with me and, and we sat with Sudan because he was a, Sudan was a very old, tired man at that point. Um, and we were kind of able to look in his eyes and I had this overwhelming feeling of kind of anger that I'd felt with the poached elephant again. I was like, you know, you are the last male line and that's entirely down to human behavior and, and we've wiped you out because of how we have a disregard for species on this planet. And so I, I actually turned to Dan that night and said, it's gonna have to be rhinos, isn't it? And he said, yeah, it is. And, and, and we kind of went from there. And, and then you'll, you'll hear all my friends, I always say, I'm not gonna do another book because it, it gets so stressful and it's so all con in consuming when I'm making the launch. Um, but then I think it's a bit like childbirth after, um, after a few weeks, I forget all the pain <laughs> and, I, and I just have a beautiful baby. And I think, oh, I could do that. Um, so, yeah, so now the Remembering Bears will be our seventh book. I can't believe I've been going like seven years on this now. I mean, they are incredible. We've got a question coming through um, from Mariana. Um, and there's, so they're asking, can you buy the books in um, Europe? She's based in the Netherlands. You can. Um, our website, rememberingwildlife.com, if you order from us, you uh, all of the 45 pounds, which is the cost of a book, um, goes to the cause and we're able to send those profits out. I'll be honest though, because of Brexit, the, the gift that keeps on giving, um, there are random customs charges for books that we send into Europe. Sometimes none are applied, sometimes they can be charged like 20 euros on top. So if people are worried about making sure they, um, that don't get stung for any extra costs, then like Amazon will sell them and you can order through Amazon and use Prime and have free delivery. So we get less money. We get like half of the, the cover price if we sell it by a, a retailer. So that's why I encourage people to come direct to us, but completely understand if you just want to order from Amazon and we'll still get something from that. And we've got another comment coming through from Winnie, which I think is a, is a good comment. Thank you, Winnie. Lovely to see you on the show. And she's asking, um, she would love to see children in schools to see your books as they're so educational. And she's wondering if UK councils could be prepared to buy them a copy for their teachers to teach from. Is this an option for you to kind of do some outreach there as well? Yeah, possibly. I mean, there's so many wonderful ideas like that and, and ways to kind of pursue um, trying to build distribution. And um one of the things that holds us back on those kind of things is just you know that our resource there's kind of you know I, i'm the only person who's more or less full time and then i have a number of kind of people who help out from an editor to a designer to an hr uh, sorry um finance director um i have an assistant but 
um, you know, the, the more I spend on kind of people's time, the less money we raise. So I'm, I'm always kind of balancing this tightrope as to, to what we do. But but if anyone knows anyone who's got contacts on UK councils, you could get teachers <laughs> books, please get in touch. I love that. And that's the thing as well. I'm, often people think it, it comes just down to money when it comes to support. But if people can help you in other ways, like volunteering or providing those connections and that kind of thing, that is also another way that people can help to spread awareness um, for the projects that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I've loved about this, and I had no idea what would come from this, is the community that's built up around our books. So um, we do have volunteers. We've got a volunteer group that's probably about 50 strong now of people who um, help us with our events every year. So come and man our exhibition and, you know, kind of um, sit on the ticket desk at the, the Royal Geographical Society when people are coming into the event. Um, and then, you know, I kind of have noticed whatever skill people have got, they they offer it. So I'm a jeweler, can I make jewellery for you to sell? Or I'm an artist, can I make, you know, a piece of art for you? And and so on. So, yeah, whatever skills and contacts and things people have got, if they're inspired by what we're doing, then, you know, I'm always really happy to get help. And you mentioned earlier that all the profits, that uh, all the money that you get from the book goes to conservation organisations. Um, are they based on the, the animal that you're covering? So, for example, if this book on rhinos, it would go to rhino projects. And also following on from that, how do you decide which organisations benefit from them? Sure, yes. I mean, when I started, I I was very naive. I hadn't worked in conservation. I, I did partner with the Born Free Foundation to help us make our decisions in those early days as to where funds went. Um, so that I didn't get kind of ripped off um, naively. But um, I kind of thought, poached elephant, I need to raise money to give guns to the rangers, they can shoot the poachers, job done, you know, we'll stop poaching. And I had no idea how complex conservation was. Um, and and so it's been a rapid learning curve for me. Um, so to answer the question, yes, we will always aim to try and um, help give money to organizations working for the specific species that we're promoting. But for example, if you do pay for anti-poaching patrols in Meru, which is one of the things we did in those early days with the elephant money, you're also protecting the rhinos that are there and the lions that are there and everything else that's kind of in, in the landscape. So um it, it's sometimes you know we, we did it recently or last year we paid for a vaccination program in northern kenya against canine distemper and rabies of domestic dogs but that's a disease that actually threatens both cheetahs and wild dogs so we were kind of helping both so you know sometimes i'm looking and saying well which one do we peg this down to um again yeah if we've got researchers who are kind of out watching some species they're also, you know, kind of out there, eyes and ears and stopping poachers from, from other species as well. So, um, so yes, in, loosely, we're supporting the, the specific species, but hopefully it also has a halo on, on other species as well. Um, and then as to how do we choose, I mean, quite often it comes from strong recommendations from people that I know well. Um, and so, for example, Jonathan and Angela Scott, who I mentioned earlier, who were one of the first sets of photographers to sign up and people I had kind of got to know before I started this book series and really influenced me about thinking about conservation. Um, they are patrons of the Cheetah Conservation Fund in, in Namibia. So when we were doing a cheetah book, it was very obvious that we should support an organization that they have vetted and they rate. And, you know, I was able to go and visit Laurie Marker there and understand their work. Um, so often, you know, recommendations from someone like, you know, if Jonathan Scott says that's a good organisation, you know, you, you pretty much know they've been vetted. Um, and other photographers will will recommend projects that they rate as well um, and that they've worked with. So, for example, we've supported um, an organisation called Seralo, which is the um, in the South Rift Valley. Um, and what they do is they work. Um, on community lands that is between national parks, so actually like between the Masai Mara Reserve and Amboseli, but it's community land and lions go through there, in, you know, interact with humans, potentially 
take their cattle um, and then are subject to retaliation. So Sarala were out there trying to actually work with the local community to stop retaliation and, and enable them to work alongside such species. So again, we paid for a new vehicle for, for Sarala um, so that because their last vehicle was on its last legs. And one of the things they needed was a vehicle big enough to put a cow in the back uh, because if a cow is left out during the day by the children who are often the ones looking after the herd, um, and not paying attention because they're being kids and playing, um, and that cow stays out overnight, it probably would get killed by lions. So um, that the owner, the farmer, will ring up Serralo and say, I've lost a cow. They go and hopefully find the cow, stuff it in the back of their vehicle and deliver it home so that it's safe and no lion eats the cow that night. So again, you know, I originally I'm thinking, give a gun to a ranger and that's job done. Now I'm like, give a vehicle that will fit a cow in. Um, <laughs> there are many things that, you know, the, the, the reach of what we do. Um, but I'm always just, you know, I, I listen very carefully to proposals for how projects would like to spend our money and I will push back sometimes and say I'm not really interested in that you know what we're trying to do is perpetuate the opportunity for these animals to live in the wild so we won't just be remembering them in, in picture books so projects have got to be doing work that for me ticks that box and previously with your last six books they had focused on Africa and Asian elephants uh, and you announced on social media um, a little while ago that you are now going to be doing a remembering bears focus. What was the reason for um, kind of switching to bears and how do you decide what animal you're going to cover? Yes, well, I mean, so we had covered a little bit of Asia, not only in the rhino book, but also with grey tapes, because obviously we had orangutans in there as well, which um, are, are not African based. But my um, experience, because I was working out there and, and the time I'd spent had largely been African. So it was kind of easier for me to do an African species each time. But um, I have a lot of people lobbying me all the time for different species that we ought to be covering. Um, you know, th there's everything from whales to pangolins to eagles to, you know there's just so many that obviously need attention and even giraffes you know with your picture behind you people are <laughs> that was um, going to be my suggestion to be <laughs> fair <laughs> um, but um i don't know i just kind of listen to everyone's suggestions and kind of in the end i have to follow my own gut feel and i'm thinking you know if this series is going to have a legacy and people are buying our books, you know, what's a kind of, you know, incredibly important species that actually is pretty much across everywhere else on the globe, apart from Africa. Um, and not at least because that will help bring in, you know, hopefully like the, the US market, we do have distribution in the US and Canada, but they're so important to people there. So I had lots of US kind of, you know, supporters saying, why aren't you covering anything that we have here? You know, they're important too. So. It just felt the right time to me to do bears, um, but I am on a swift learning curve. Um, there are eight species. I've never even seen one myself yet. So um, I'm, I'm desperately kind of working on how I can get to see um, some bears somewhere very soon. Um, and in the meantime, I'm Skyping around the world from Borneo to Churchill and everywhere in between to start learning from experts who do know about bears what are the issues that we need to cover off? Uh, and it's actually really fun. I was saying to someone the other day, it's a bit like, remember when you had a school project, you, they'd say, in this term, you're learning about Brazil and you know, about the end of the term, you, new stuff you didn't know before. It's the same thing. And I, it, it's a privilege that I'm suddenly in this position that I have the right to kind of make this choice and then indulge my time, you know, learning all about a, another wonderful species. And that kind of feeds into my next question, because the books, are, alongside being incredibly um, beautiful visually, they are educational as well. You tell the story of the animal often from when it's born and the process and the family set up and all that kind of stuff. So do you, you, you go about gathering that information, talking to experts and, and bringing that in? Is that how that works? Yes, indeed. So again, I have to think about what I think are the, the major issues that each species needs to be talked about and then who are the best people to kind of illustrate that so um i mean i worked with um ian redmond on the great ape book he's a renowned expert on apes so he was um obviously very helpful and you know and he guided me on things like we had a whole issue about ethical shopping in there and thinking about you know palm oil or not palm oil and and you know the, the choices that you make when you're shopping the impact it's having in a rainforest somewhere on the other side of the world that you don't even think about um, on the cheetah book, I had um, a researcher who'd done a paper saying that cheetah mothers were less successful raising their cubs to 
adulthood when they were under tourist pressure um, and so then tourism really has to um, be thought about. And obviously I'd even seen, you know, in the Maasai Mara, you know, cheetahs climbing on vehicles and, and things that shouldn't be happening. So, um, so yes, again, I, I, I'm, I'm speaking to bear experts to kind of understand what, what are those key things that, you know, I need to make sure we disseminate. And I have to learn a whole lot more to then reduce it down to what the, the, the you know, the key parts that, that will communicate, because we are largely photographic books. So it's not, a, it's not a science book, it's not a textbook, it's a beautiful coffee table book full of the most beautiful pictures you've ever seen on that animal, um, with, you know, with, with the essays to support it, with all the basic facts and figures that you need to know. And do you get to go out yourself and go to these different countries to see the animals and take your own photographs? Well, in uh, for the, all of the uh, previous books, I had already photographed all of those species. And, well, not not um, not any of the Asian species, but the the ones that were African based from my time in Africa. So, um, yes, up till now, I have had a a image, one image, because all of the books are one image per photographer. You know, we had eighty photographers who contributed to the Wild Dog book. So, I have had an image in, in each book so far. I don't have any bear pictures right now, so we'll see. As I said, I, I want to try and get to a bear project um, in the next few months if I possibly can, and then if I get something good enough, I'll have a picture. But if not, um, I, I won't. It's not about whether my picture's in there or not anymore. It's, it's well, it never, it never was, but um, it's, yeah, it, it's more about me making sure that we've represented that animal in the best possible way. And if people are watching this back home and they want to support the work that you're doing, what's the best way for them to go about doing so? Well, I mean, as we said, it, it's buy a book, buy a book for themselves, buy a book as a gift for someone else. Um, yeah, if they sign up on rememberingwildlife.com, um, oh yes, so, so Jackie there is one of our wonderful volunteers um, and does a lot for us, so thanks Jackie. Um, yeah, if they go into rememberingwildlife.com, uh, they can also subscribe and then they'll get updates about this new book. They'll hear when the Kickstarter is coming along. Um, it's a great thing to support our Kickstarter campaigns because, say, that gives us the funding and the momentum to actually, um, you know, make the next book. So, um, yeah, sign up to our, our database so you can hear about us and, and consider buying the books and gifting the books um, because then, yeah, the more we sell, the more we raise, the more we give out. And you mentioned earlier, uh, for example, the, the lovely jewellery that you wear in there. So is that available for sale as well? Uh, on the Kickstarter. So we have a, a lovely jeweller who um, does a number of pieces and he has confirmed he will be doing some bear pieces for us. Um, so they're all based on pictures from the books and the photographers um, who are contributing to the books. Um, and they're all limited edition and numbered. Um, so, uh, yeah, people get a very unique kind of hallmarked piece um, and then we'll have prints donated. And we also sell um, safaris and, and kind of lodge days as well that um, we're lucky enough people donate to us. So, again, if people have got, you know, what we want to, is it, if there's some bear operator out there who'd like to donate a stay at their bear lodge, um, please get in touch because um, it's, it's only because we collaborate with so many people that we're successful and so many people want to contribute. You know, it's not, it, it's a huge team effort. Um, and, say, and then, then it's fun. There's lots of goodies on the um, the Kickstarter to, to grab. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so I've only got one more question left. If you're watching back home and you would like to put a question to Margot, please just pop it on the comments section and I will be able to do that for you. And um, we've had some lovely comments as we've been talking, a lot of people supporting the work that you're doing and saying how beautiful these books are as well, which is lovely to see. People from all around the world commenting as well, which is also incredible to see. Um, so I wanted to ask you what your favorite success story is and how that came about. There are so many. I mean, it's, it's my favorite part of the whole thing is when we're able to give out funds to projects that are doing great work um, and get behind something um, you know, that, that maybe wouldn't happen if we hadn't been able to support them. So um, I, I've loved many of the projects we've supported, but fresh in my mind because it was part of the, the Wild Dog book um, was a translocation that um, was a joint initiative between African parks who we had supported before and the Endangered Wildlife Trust um, last summer. Um, and that was to translocate two packs of wild dogs um, to Malawi where they haven't been seen since the 1950s with the aim of actually starting to repopulate Malawi 
now that African parks are running the, the parks there and kind of have made them safe as a place that, that the dogs could roam free. Mm. Uh, so um, it was actually African parks who alerted me to the fact that they were going to be doing this initiative. And um, I kind of scraped money around from the Kickstarter so early before we even launched the book to help fund that launch. Um, I was on a WhatsApp group where we were hearing about the um, trials and tribulations of trying to make it happen. It was pulled off twice. Once because the night before the COVID rules changed and they weren't the teams weren't able to cross the borders into Malawi, who closed the borders. The second time there were riots in South Africa. I don't know if you remember last summer, but and again the, the team were like we'd actually like um put the dogs to sleep and they were in the, the truck ready to be driven to the airport and we're afraid that we'll get attacked on the road by the rioters and the dogs would get killed. So then they pulled it back. So there were so many obstacles, but they got there in the end. And since then, the dogs have now had puppies. So we're already fulfilling that. There are more than the dogs that we took out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, And I can't take credit for the amazing work. It's EWT, it's the vets on the ground in Malawi, it's African parks. But um, you know, the fact we were able to help kind of facilitate that to happen it's it's everything to do with what we're doing we don't want to remember them in wild in, in books uh, we want them to be out there in the wild so um i love the idea that uh, hopefully maybe i'll get to malawi one day and see wild dogs there and know that we played a role in that yeah i mean that's incredible i mean it, it's it is work like what you're doing that allows people to do this conservation so uh and for you to be able to then see how your hard work has related to an increase in, in these uh, African wild dogs is incredible. Um, we, as I say, we ha we're gonna start to wrap up now. We've had, as we said, some lovely comments coming through. People are saying that they don't want their uh, grandchildren to just see photos and not the real thing. And I completely agree. Um, is there anything that you would like to say before we wrap up? Um, no, I just uh, thank thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to everyone who's watching, and thank you to each and every person who's helped make our our, our books a success. As I say, it's it's so many people from volunteers to photographers to people who donate stuff, um, everyone who buys the books. Um, you know, it's a huge team effort, and it's just you know that's what we do when we work together that's what we can achieve you know and no one should ever think that their role they can't do something because even if they just share um you know the fact that the kickstarter is going on or whatever they're helping to spread the word and, and help us all to help these animals who don't have a voice i mean that's to go back to how i felt with the original elephant you know these animals do not have a voice these things are being done to them and so we have to use our voices to help them yeah, I completely agree. And thank you so much. I'm, it's sad that it took something so tragic to, to spur you into action, but the, the action that you have done is incredible and it has benefited so many different animals across the world and different species un, un, under the umbrella of that. So thank you so much. And thank you for coming on the show as well. Um, if you're watching back home and you've enjoyed the show, please give it a like, comment and share. The more people that can see it, the more awareness we can raise and the more work we can do together to help save these animals. Um, thank you very much for watching and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.